I'm going to talk a little bit on the medical management of spinal meds with more of a focus on preliminary data for um, targeted therapy and immunotherapy. Can you hear me okay? I hear you yes. great. Cool. Great, great, great. Um, oops. I have no disclosures for the talk. So uh, a little bit of the epidemiology, about 40% of patients with uh, cancer will develop uh, spinal metastasis. Of those patients, about 90 to 95 will have metastasis to the vertebrae um, and the uh, spinal cord or in the epidural region of the spinal cord. There was an um, autopsy study which showed that upwards about 70% of patients will have spinal metastasis. That's pretty striking. It could be um, um, subclinical uh, metastasis as well. Any tumor can metastasize, can, can disseminate to the spine. Uh, the common offenders are the breast, lung, and the prostate. Um, and, and, and those are the solid, of the solid tumors. Um, we also see a fair amount of unknown primary, um, which can be a challenge during the workup. The tumors can uh, disseminate to any, any region of the uh, spinal, the, the axis, the neuroaxis. axis, um, but there is a high tropism for seating in the thoracic spine, about 70%, followed by the lumbosacral area and the cervical region. There's always uh, the chance of multi-level involvement. We always ask, well, I always ask for uh, MRI of the entire spine, even if we discover uh, a tumor in one lesion one region. Um, and of course, leptomeningeal carcinomatosis is also a concern for patients with um, widely metastatic disease in the end stage. A little bit about the pathophysiology, the arterial spread is most common uh, uh, conduit for, for, for dissemination. Um, and, and, and seating is usually more prominent in the anterior spinal cord owing to the um, blood supply. We do see uh, there's thought of the uh, retrograde venous spread uh, via the basin uh, plexus, tumors in the pelvic spine. There's also lymphatic spread and extension from the paraspinal disease. Somewhat of a busy slide, but the idea here is just to illustrate that it's a complex signal cascade um, involving tumor and you know in, in evading or, or invading the neighboring stromal cells, going into the blood vessels, um, um, hanging out in the blood vessels, and eventually ending up in the uh, tumor and distant sites in the bone. Um, there's a lot of key, key players, cytokines, growth factors. Um, that trigger or orchestrate uh, tumor uh, metastasis. As already mentioned, uh, you can have tumor involving the intradural extramedullary space, intramedullary uh, nerve root extradural, and also we can also see tumors late uh, or sometimes early in the um, um, leptomeninges. Clinical manifestations are a variable. Pain is most common. It can be localized uh, pain, localized pain due to stretching of the uh, periosteum as the tumor grows or, or venous congestion can have mechanical, mechanical pain uh, due to spinal instability, radicular pain with nerve root involvement, uh, motor dysfunction, late sensory, uh, sensory and dysautonomia. Treatment is palliative. Uh, the goal is to preserve uh, functional status and improve quality of life. It takes a team, um, a multidisciplinary team, and um, involving uh, surgeons, radiation oncologists, med medical oncologists, uh, physiatrists, palliative care, and pain specialists. Several prognostication or scoring systems uh, were developed. Uh, one of the most uh, widely uh, recognized is the tomato scoring system, which includes elements of the primary tumor, the growth rate, whether it's visceral mets or bone mets. Uh, prior to this scoring system was the uh, Tokuhashi uh, scoring system. Um, which was uh, published in, 2000, in 1989 and later revised um, in 2005. 
um, to include patients who are being treated conservatively with uh, chemotherapy, hormonal therapy. And uh, the, re the, re the revised scoring system, again, incorporated, looked at performance status, number of bone mats, uh, vertebral body mats, um, tumor, prim different primary tumors and the degree of palsy. That scoring system was challenged. Um, and uh, the idea was, you know, it, it was a lot as heterogeneous and um, it, it uh, probably did not include patients who were treated with targeted therapy. We're seeing now that patients with lung, uh, lung cancer uh, with meds treated with targeted therapy. This was a study that looks at, looked at um, the overall survival of patients who received targeted therapy and, and who did not. And we see the survival curve um, was, was extended. Another study uh, showed that patients who received, uh, lung cancer patients who received targeted therapy, uh, the survival was uh, more favorable. In clinical practice, um, however, uh, systemic uh, uh, therapy, um, it, you know, it, it, the role remains undefined. Um, there's little value for patients with catastrophic disease, acute disease. It's seldom used on a standalone basis, um, but it may be suitable for those uh, tumors that are chemosensitive, like lymphoma, uh, um, uh, multiple myeloma, germ cell tumors, which are sensitive to platinum-based chemotherapy, prostate cancer, um, sensitive to hormonal therapy, and in the current era of um, molecular uh, molecular uh, data for, for tumors, we now know that tumors that acquire the T790 mutation following uh, EGFR treatment are sensitive to osimertinib. Um, one of the key drivers for melanoma, BRAF, uh, MEK, ERK pathway, um, if we inhibit that pathway, we are seeing extended survival for patients with uh, metastatic melanoma. Also, patients with breast Breast cancer, HER2 positive, uh, 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 respond favorably with leptomeningeal, leptomeningeal disease to IT receptin. Um, this is, there's some emerging data for bone targeted therapy. We know that osteoclast uh, activation uh, stimulates bone degradation. Um, if we exploit that pathway and inhibit that, the, the rank L uh, binding to the, the rank receptor on osteoclast, uh, there's a drug called dis, dis, denosumab, which is able to downregulate or suppress bone turnover. There's evidence that these um, receptors exist on prostate cancer. It was a study that was done that enrolled about 1,400 men. We gave half uh, the study drug and half placebo. And that study showed that there was a significant increase uh, in bone-free survival um, by a medium of 4.2 months over placebo. It also delayed the time to first bone metastasis in patients with uh, prostate cancer. In the era of onco-immunology, uh, onco we now know that we can harness the T cells in the tumor microenvironment by inhibiting uh, the pathway, the PD-1, PDL one pathway. And if we can induce a robust uh, uh, stimulation of the T cells, we, we get uh, tumor suppression. This was a case of a patient with uh, lung, uh, lung cancer. Um, she had widely metastatic, metastatic disease. She had a lot of brain disease. Um, she received a uh, cyber knife to those lesions in the brain. Um, surveillance imaging found a metastasis, intramedullary uh, metastasis in the cervical region, lots of uh, edema surrounding. She was asymptomatic. Um, she, radiation was deferred, no steroids. Um, she was treated with Nevo and there was significant regression, durable uh, regression uh, following treatment with NEVO. So, you know, NEVO or, or checkpoint inhibitors may be, may be a potential treatment option for patients with small asymptomatic solitary uh, intramedullary metastasis from lung cancer. Um, also, if detected early, it's possible that, you know, we may be able to defer radi radiotherapy 
and corticosteroids in this patient population. Again, uh, one of the key drivers for um, melanoma, the BRF MEK inhibitor, there are new drugs available now to target this pathway um, that are FDA approved. And there's a few studies now that are showing regression of um, melanoma METs in the spinal cord following um, BRAF and, and, and MEK inhibitors. So that looks really promising. Another study showed uh, patients who were treated with the orsimertinib, uh, lung, lung cancer patients with METs, um, leptomeningeal spread uh, from the brain and uh, in the spine, um, patients were, there were two cohorts, uh, brain METs and leptomeningeal METs. Um, the primary endpoint was overall survival. They predicted a survival of five months. Um, but uh, the, the results were pretty striking. The median survival was actually 13 months. This is remarkable for patients with um, uh, leptomeningeal disease, which you know, carries a very dismal and poor prognosis. This was a study done by colleagues at uh, MGH. Um, uh, Priscilla Brastianos and her colleagues looked at uh, PEMBRO, uh, also, another checkpoint inhibitor in a phase two is a single arm uh, study. Enrolling patients, 20 patients were enrolled, 17 with breast, uh, two with lung, one with ovarian cancer. Um, the primary endpoint was survival at three months. That study showed and concluded with uh, it was well tolerated, uh, and the efficacy was pretty good. 60% uh, of patients were alive at three months. So I, I think uh, in the world of um, cancer-directed uh, treatment uh, from, a, from a medical management perspective, um, uh, we're heading in the right direction. The future looks promising. Um, we need more trials um, 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 and, and, and more collaborations. But things are looking good, and um, I'm optimistic. And I will conclude with that. Thanks. Thank you so much, Kester. That was a terrific Thank talk. You. Um, Thank you. One of the things I just wanted to ask you, this is just in general, you know, we're fortunate to have you here at Swedish, um, but, you know, spinal metastasis is an interesting area because the medical oncologists aren't necessarily always thrilled to be taking care of these patients right. until they get a diagnosis. And it's like this ping pong that goes back and forth between you know, the surgeons and then people want tissue. And as Udi pointed out, you know, it's, sometimes it's not good to do a biopsy. So um, I think one of the things that's really pushed the field forward is neuro-oncology and having folks like yourself um, who get involved in early in the care of these patients. What's your thought on or perspective on it? Do you agree that that's an important part of you know, what's, especially with spine mats, because it's so common. I, mean, I think the interface with neuro-oncology and, and neurosurgery is, is very, is very important. Yes, we play a very important role, um, guiding management, guiding treatment, um, the workup, the algorithm, uh, so in some cases, you know, um, yeah, we, you know, if you can't approach it, sometimes we need an LP and LP can do, we can get liquid biopsy, which is a growing and emerging field as well. Um, but yeah, I, 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 I agree. I agree that we do need to collaborate. We do need to work together. Well, it's been, you know, it's, it's great having you here at Sweden. Yeah, absolutely. We shared a, we shared a, a lot of patients, um, very interesting patients, complex cases. And, uh, um, you know, it's, uh, one of these, uh, areas where, like I said, um, uh, um, there's just so much opportunity to collaborate, um, orthopedics, you know, neurosurgery, yeah. call, medical oncology, uh, neuro-oncology. In addition, um, <clears throat> radio surgery, we're going to talk about, you know, that's an area that's evolving as well. So, yeah. so and again, both Udi and, and um, <clears throat> Bernard can weigh in, but these patients are living longer and longer. Yeah. So, um, yeah. I'm having go back in and do more, especially for spine metastasis. I don't know how, what you feel, Udi and uh, Bernard. Yeah, I think uh, one critical component of this collaboration is spine tumor board. So, you know, it's very common in neurosurgery to have a brain tumor board, 
But there should be, especially if you're dealing with a lot of these like we do, we have a dedicated spine tumor board that is completely collaborative. And, and Duke, who is my partner in this, is going to give a talk about it. He's, he's my main guy for the, uh, for the radiation input. But it's a team's approach. Um, I th and then the neuro-oncologists are there too. I think the difficulty that we have with spine tumor board is the medical oncology component. Mm. And it's not, and the part of it is because the radiation guys are pretty much the same radiation guys that are involved with these cases, especially with a stereotactic radio surgery. But when you're dealing with medical oncology here at the James, we have, you know, specific medical oncologists for every entity, every type of cancer. And it's difficult to get the medical oncologist on a particular patient to our uh, spine tumor board because it's going to be a different medical oncologist for every patient. Mm -hmm. So on certain situations where there is a lot of decision-making that has to be made about a patient, we will make sure that the corresponding medical oncologist who is involved with the care of this patient is on the call. Otherwise, and I know how it is in Swedish, uh, maybe you take care of all the patients with, uh, with uh, spine lesions, but here at the James, we have just very you know, multitude of multitude of medical oncologists and so it's very difficult for them, for, for us to coordinate the medical oncologist for that particular patient to participate in that in particular the spine tumor board. Right. We can get no oncology, we can get radiation oncology, we can get neurosurgery. It's always difficult with medical oncology. Sometimes I was pushing to get a representation of a medical oncology entity on tumor board because we are not as familiar with all the you know, chemotherapy <laughs> right. options. Right. The medical options, you know, the side effects of these medications, how long, and a lot of times you guys ask us, when can we start our treatment? You know, how mm -hmm. long do you have to wait mm -hmm. before we can start our chemotherapy? Immunotherapy is not as difficult as much as the chemotherapy component that always comes into play. So going back to what Rod was saying, I think the team's approach, the multi-collaborative, the multidisciplinary component is so critical on these patients. Very, very critical. Yeah. I'll be happy to step in and, and, and participate in your, um, your, your, your tumor board. If, yeah. You know, yeah. If there's a void and there's a need. 